All right, so we're going to get started. If anyone joins, they'll be able to join in. Hopefully everyone received the case um, document as well as a copy of the PowerPoint that was sent out previously. Um, and thank you all for joining us today via Zoom, given the current situation. Um, it's still great that we can review um, this epilepsy presentation today. So I'm Elise Scora. I'm the clinical director of New York START. Uh, Andy Kent, medical director, START. Um, I am going to have us try to go around and introduce ourselves. Um, we also have one other person in the room. Hi, I'm Heather Strine. I'm a coordinator. Okay. So I will try to go through who I see on my screen just to make it a little bit organized. So we have Nicole, if you could just introduce yourself and your role. Hello, uh, my name is Nicole Stanek. I'm a New York Start Suffolk coordinator. Thank you. And I'm very excited for this presentation today. <laughs> Glad to have you. Uh, Courtney? Hello, I'm Courtney. I'm one of the clinical team leads for New York Start in Suffolk. Thank you. Liz? She's a little less excited. <laughs> <laughs> Liz Wheeler is a uh, coordinator with NASA. Uh, Yvette? Hi, I'm a coordinator. I'm uh, sorry, Beth Lorenzo, coordinator at NASA. Thank you. Danielle? Hi, Danielle Friedman, uh, New York Start, a team leader for NASA. Thank you. Christina Rinaldi? Hi, mental health specialist with ACA. Thank you for joining us. I see Caitlin Wilson. Hi, Caitlin Wilson, Wilson. mental health specialist with ACA. Thank you. Stephanie? Hi, good morning. Um, I am a Suffolk coordinator with New York START. Thank you. Jennifer? Hi, I'm Jennifer Seaman. I'm a NASA coordinator. Thank you. Uh, and Allison? Hi, I'm Allison. Um, I am a Suffolk coordinator with New York START. Great, thank you. Anyone that I missed that's on? Okay, so as always, um, we always start our clinical teams with a review of the case. Um, ben is our case today. Um, so you all should have received um, via email the case document. Um, our plan for today will be giving you guys some time to review the case document. Um, Heather, as the assigned coordinator, will give you an overview of the case. Um, we'll take any questions. Um, any comments, any initial thoughts. Um, and then Andy and I will go through the PowerPoint regarding epilepsy. Um, and as always, if you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt um, at that moment. You don't need to hold them till the end. Um, at the end of the presentation, we'll bring it back to our case, Ben, um, and see if anyone that's participated has any recommendations of things that we can do for this young man. Um, and Heather will take the opportunity to summarize any of the recommendations that are made um, that she can bring back to the system. So I will mute myself just for a few minutes so that you guys have time to read the case study. Um, Without having everyone in person, I'm going to estimate as to when you guys will be done. Um, so probably about five to seven minutes, okay? All right, so I gave you guys about 10 minutes. So we are going to continue on. Um, so Heather is going to give you an overview of Ben's case um, and kind of fill in a little bit of gaps and explain some things a little further. Um, after that, we will um, discuss the case, answer any questions that you guys have, and then move on to the PowerPoint. So here's Heather. Hello, everyone. Um, so Ben is a caring, loving, and honest young boy living in Suffolk County with his parents, younger brother, and dog Walker. He thoroughly enjoys caring for animals and has participated in a therapeutic horse riding program since age eight. Additionally, Ben enjoys taking part in a game development program where he is able to use his love for technology and skills in a positive environment. Ben was referred to START due to increasing behavioral health symptoms such as physical and verbal aggression, property destruction, self-injurious behavior, and suicidal statements. The family was also in need of assistance as his behavioral health symptoms occurred primarily in his home environment and when engaging with his parents. Ben was diagnosed with epilepsy at four years of age after exhibiting several epileptic episodes. 
He was diagnosed with symptomatic epilepsy after an MRI identified a lesion on the right occipital parietal portion of his brain. It was hypothesized that this was caused by a stroke in utero. After undergoing a variety of different testing, such as EEGs, routine awake studies, and sleep studies, um, it was noted that he exhibits prominent seizure activity at night, waking him up approximately 240 times. Due to this, he never enters REM sleep, leading to daytime drowsiness. The frequency of his seizures is unknown as he is exhibiting constant seizure activity due to the lesion. Additionally, he experiences left side weakness, and this in conjunction with the concerns of the lesion has contributed to him not being able to be involved in certain activities, such as contact sports. Often, Ben's seizures are identified by staring episodes, eye fluttering, and inability to take in information or notice the world around him. In September of 2018, Ben reported several incidences where he may have encountered a seizure or seizure-like activity. He reported he felt as if his brain was shutting down and felt extremely drowsy. He reported um, as if his right leg was vibrating and he could not walk. His mother reported he was disoriented when she picked him up from school, but then he slept one to two hours and was okay when he woke up. Um, in late 2019, Ben's family noticed him staring at a family party and ultimately left out of concern. They reported he snapped out of it as soon as they got in the car. Ben also underwent several medication changes to attempt to control the seizures. However, Ben often exhibited side effects such as excessive weight gain and aggressive symptoms. When being titrated off Depakote, he experienced a side effect of suicidal ideation, ultimately leading to him being evaluated at a local hospital. He was released the same day, and although um, he is on a medication with no current notable side effects, his seizure activity remains uncontrolled. Due to this, Ben's independence is often severely limited. He is not able to go anywhere without somebody able to administer his emergency medication and is followed by a one-on-one -on -one aide and nurse throughout his school day. This often limits his, his community engagement and participation in social settings. Also, this contributes to the family's anxiety due to the unpredictability of this condition. Most recently, Ben was given a prescription for a seizure monitoring bracelet to further assist in him gaining independence. The bracelet monitors seizures and sends an alert to the parent's um, cell phone if anything is detected. When in school, the nurse will be notified and will call him out of class when necessary. Ben is also diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, and a mild intellectual disability, as well as dyscalculia. It is important to note that although Ben often presents with symptoms associated with autism, such as fleeting eye contact and intense rumination, um, and autism was mentioned as a potential diagnosis as early as three years of age, he was not formally diagnosed until age eight when he participated in an autism-focused research study at, an, at a local university, where he was formally diagnosed with moderate ASD following them administering the autism diagnostic observation schedule. Additionally, he is diagnosed with dyscalculia, which is the inability to process numbers or facts. This has led to adjustments being made in his math class where his world problems are enlarged and he is able to utilize a calculator. Math class is at times a trigger for him and he will request to go to the nurse during class to avoid classwork. Ben also presents with increased anxiety, often relating to classwork or task demands throughout his day, especially at home. Sometimes this leads to him exhibiting behavioral health symptoms. Currently, he is monitored by a psychiatrist to address the symptoms associated with his other diagnoses and anxiety since visiting the hospital due to the suicidal ideation and concerns related to his mood stability. Um, he is currently engaged in in-home therapeutic coaching and coaches were able to um, introduce and assist the family in identifying useful coping skills and build capacity within the home. They have been able to provide important insight, especially in regards to the importance of structure in the home, as well as the utilization of positive language and reinforcements. They have been able to use the sessions to work on relationship building amongst the family members, and there has been a more positive relationship noticed between him and his brother as he is able to participate in the sessions together. Importantly, Ben is at puberty age, where he is, um, where his hormonal and physical changes may be further exacerbating his behavioral health symptoms. Potentially, individuals with autism can see an increase in agitation and irritability, affective instability, increased anxiety, and sensory sensitivities during the onset and duration of his puberty. As noticed on the EcoMap, Ben has a lot of positive relationships currently present in his life. An important part 
to point out is his dog Walker, who he identifies as his most important coping skill. He will identify her when asked what best calms him down in times of crisis, and she will be she will allow him to pet her, and is even laid out down next to him when exhibiting a possible seizure. Important to note that there is little collaboration amongst medical providers, such as the neurologist and psychiatrist. Due to the seriousness of his conditions, active communication and collaboration would be useful strategies to promote consistency and better be able to support Ben, especially in regards to his medication management. Additionally, the school, the school system has been reluctant to engage with other members of the system as of now. However, further exploration into this could be useful in order to assess what structure is incorporated there, as this could be brought back to the home environment to promote consistency. It has been difficult for Ben to identify natural supports outside of his family members, possibly due to his limited independence. Most recently, Ben has expressed he has a girlfriend, which has shown to be a positive addition to his life. Ben, and Ben's parents thoroughly love and care for him. However, it is evident that the parents have difficulty engaging with Ben, especially at times of crisis, often using a more negative tone. It is determined that burnout could be a contributing factor as he primarily experiences his frustration in crisis situations when with his parents. Thank you, Heather. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about the case, what you guys read, what Heather reviewed? Any initial thoughts? Nothing? Everyone's good? We're good to go home? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well then we will jump into the PowerPoint. Um, as always, you know, most of you have been with us before. Um, Andy and I definitely want to keep this conversational. So if you have questions um, as we're going along on the slides, please feel free to unmute and interrupt so that we can answer those questions. Um, and just a reminder, Heather will be writing down any recommendations that come up throughout the PowerPoint as well as that you guys bring up. Um, and hopefully we can leave the CET with some recommendations to bring back to the system. So we will get started on the training. All right. So. What is epilepsy? Um, epilepsy is a disorder of the brain. Uh, it's characterized by having at least two or more seizures. Um, there, is, there are multiple types of seizures and we will go into um, some more details regarding that. Um, the psychological impact is really important. So cognitive activity is affected by the underlying brain pathology, by the effects of repeated interruptions in consciousness. Um, as well as by the anti-epileptic drugs. Um, all of these things tend to reduce cognitive function. It might lead to sedation, poor motivation, and also be expressed as irritability, impulsivity, and disinhibition. Um, the repeated disruption of consciousness interrupts memory and learning as well, um, in particular with absent seizures, where the seizures are brief and may be unrecognized, but are often frequent, uh, especially in children. A person, <clears throat> excuse me, with undiagnosed partial status epileptus may resemble someone with severe ID or autism. When their epilepsy is treated, their whole demeanor may change dramatically. Also, psychological disturbance may occur before, during, or after a seizure. So pre-ictal is a person with complex partial seizures will commonly experience a warning or an aura, which may take the form of a particular emotional state or hallucinatory, uh, hallucinatory experience. Uh, periictal, um, for some seizures, particularly complex partial seizures affecting the temporal or frontal lobes, result in the person having a bizarre or stereotyped way, though they are partially conscious. And postictal, after seizure, many people will sleep, have severe headaches, um, they might be irritable or confused. <clears throat> Socially, fear is pretty common in a family um, with a member of their family having seizures. Um, given that there are real risks of serious injury, providers could be fearful to provide services to an individual due to these risks, whether it be a school environment, day programs, um, work experiences. Seizures could affect the access to transportation, employment, leisure, and sporting activities. As Heather discussed, it does impact Ben in the um, activities he is able to uh, participate in. Um, these potential restrictions can lead to isolation or even low self-esteem. 
Um, also, rescue medications can pose some challenges. Um, typically, it needs to be administered by someone who is trained. So that limits the experiences someone can engage in. Um, also, rectal administrations can impact self-esteem as well. Um, and also, staff could fear allegations of sexual abuse in the use of these medications. Right now, Ben is um, prescribed a rescue um, medication that is rectally administered. Um, and it's something that the system has talked about trying to move to something that's maybe more of a nasal spray. As he is getting older, um, having that experience could be something that really impacts his self-esteem. Okay, as far as types of seizures, when looking at types of seizures, it's important to distinguish between generalized versus focal. Um, and as the word sounds, general is obviously the whole brain and focal is a specific region. That being said, seizures could start locally and then spread and become generalized. So that's very common. I uh, also want to point out that in the past, focal seizures were more often caused, called partial seizures. That term is used a little less frequently now, but you'll definitely hear it. Um, so looking at some of the type of seizures, uh, at least started to mention a little bit about axon seizures, which is also called petty mal seizures. They're very associated with blinking, spacing out, looking a little bit confused. And there's a very distinct pattern uh, on the EEG. So that one is actually really helpful to diagnose. Um, and I want to point out that because the person is conscious and seemingly involved what's going on, it's not unusual that you could get somebody coming into your office and they say, my, my child has ADHD. And in fact, it could be a diagnosis of uh, absence seizures. Again, the most prevalent thing to look for is staring into space and rapid blinking. Tonic-clonic seizures involve both tonic and clonic movements. Clonic is spasms. The word clonus means spasm. You get spasms and jerks in the muscle. Tonic is more of a tone, uh, a muscle tightening and a tension, um, and it's more often seen during sleep. The tensing of the muscles usually occur for less than 20 seconds. Now the word atonic, if you hear it, anytime you put A in front of something, it means the absence of, so you lose tone, and the individual can actually drop to the floor. Uh, the myoclonic ones that often occur at night, they're really, really rapid. It's almost like an electrical shock, and if timed out, it could actually be under 0.1 second in duration, and you just may get a bunch of them through the night. Okay. okay causes of seizures. Um, a lot of causes of seizures, things that disrupt the flow of biochemical activity and the impairment of the structural integrity of the brain can do this. So as you can see on the list, stroke, of course, is a really common one. Space occupying lesion, meaning like a brain tumor and abscess can cause it. Infections, parasites, viruses, um, not coronavirus, there's no known uh, correlation there. Bacteria, traumatic brain injury uh, that you see in a motor vehicle accident, uh, and contact sports um, that can damage the tissue. So the question is, how does that cause a seizure? Well, if you damage the tissue, you get scar tissue. And if the scar tissue is affecting the nerve, that can, of course, cause. Um, seizures, loss of oxygen, and even certain genetic disorders can leave people predisposed. Um, lastly, certain deteriorating dementia type illnesses such as Alzheimer's. And the, again, the process where that happens is in Alzheimer's, the theory is that there's plaque formation. And if there's plaque formation, again, like scar tissue, that may increase the risk of the seizures. In spite of knowing all these reasons, Many people, as the slides will show, have epilepsy of an unknown origin. It's extremely, extremely common. One other thing I always like to mention in talking about seizures is febrile seizures, because these are really common in infants and young children. And there seems to be many of them where there's no structural damage uh, and they grow out of it. So very often it's not a major issue. Why it's an issue for us is we see, and I, as I'm doing this more and more and getting consults, we're seeing all these individuals on this load of anti-seizure meds, and we just assume they have seizures. But in fact, if we trace back the records and they had febrile seizures 15 years ago, there's a good bet that they don't even need this stuff anymore. And in fact, it may be doing more harm than good. So that's where what comes out of the consultations with me often is to get a reeval neurologically and see if it was indeed febrile seizures and maybe they don't really have uh, true epilepsy. 
Okay, stroke in utero, which fits with this case, caused by blocked or restricted blood flow to the brain. Anything that causes a decrease in blood flow can result in this. Again, it could be trauma, it could be a blood clot, or even malformation of the blood vessel itself. Perinatal strokes are one of the most common causes of impaired development and weakness of limbs, often in an asymmetric fashion. We see a lot of that. The definition of a perinatal stroke is one that happens between 20 weeks of gestation and about 28 days after birth. So that clearly is gonna set the stage for somebody who have these disabilities. Now in this slide, you can see an area of the brain that's impacted uh, on the upper left side, impacted by not getting enough oxygen, it results in damage to the tissue. This, this is caused by much further down the vascular tree, which is why I put those slides in, to show if there's a blockage, plaque formation like atherosclerosis, you're not gonna notice anything in that area of the neck. You're gonna see symptoms in the brain and that'll be stroke in, uh, in utero if it's in, in fact the fetus. And that's why doctors make such a big thing about plaque formation, high cholesterol and things of that sort. Uh, and on the bottom right, it's, it's a little hard to see, but that's the point of a stent. So that just widens up the carotid, which sends the blood to the brain uh, and there are even cases of putting stents in, in you know, when women are pregnant or even uh, in the fetus um, to prevent the, a stroke in utero. Okay, so in, to diagnose epilepsy, the doctor will begin with the review of the symptoms, medical history, um, and many tests might be ordered to diagnose and determine the cause. Um, like Andy said, uh, many of the seizures and epilepsy do have an unknown cause, but uh, there is a lot of workups that can be happening to determine what the cause is to ensure proper treatment. The neurological exam will include a review of behavior, motor abilities, mental function. Blood tests might be ordered to check for signs of infections, genetic conditions, or other conditions that could be related to seizures. Um, and then there's plenty of other tests that could be ordered to detect brain abnormalities, many of which Ben has had. Um, so EEGs are the most common tests used to diagnose epilepsy. In this test, electrodes are attached to the scalp with a paste-like substance, or sometimes a cap is used. The electrodes record the electrical activity of the brain. Um, it's common to have changes in your normal pattern of the brain waves, even when you're not having a seizure. So the doctor might monitor the patient on the video when uh, conducting an EEG while they're awake or asleep to record any potential seizure activity that's experienced. Recording the seizures assists the doctor in determining what kind of seizures the patient has to rule out any other conditions as well. Um, EEGs can be completed in a doctor's office or a hospital if appropriate. Um, it can be also be done at home as an ambulatory EEG, um, which may record the seizure activity over the course of a few days. A high density EEG is a vari variation of an EEG test that might be recommended. In this high density EEG, the electrodes are spaced more closely together than in a conventional EEG. And this test may help the doctor more precisely determine which area of the brain are affected by seizures. Uh, a computerized tom tomography, a CT, uses x-rays to obtain cross-sectional images of the brain. A CT scan can reveal abnormalities in the brain that might be causing the seizures, such as tumors, bleeding, and cysts. Again, really trying to get down what the etiology of the seizures are. An MRI might also be utilized, and this uses powerful magnets and radio waves to create a detailed view of the brain. Using the MRI, the doctor may be able to detect lesions or abnormalities in the brain that could be causing seizures. Functional MRIs measure the changes in blood flow that occur when specific parts of the brain are working. A doctor may utilize a functional MRI before surgeries to identify exact locations of critical functions such as speech and movement so that if surgery is being conducted for any reason on the brain, the surgeons can avoid injuring those placements while operating. PET scans, which is uh, post-tron emission tomography, uses a small amount of low dose radioactive material that's injected into a brain, into a vein, excuse me, to help visualize the active areas of the brain and also detect abnormalities. And as well as neuropsychological tests might be utilized to assess the patient's thinking, memory, and speech skills. This also util assists the doctors to determine which area of the brain is affected. I just wanna mention yeah. one quick thing on, on the MRIs. If the person has a metal implant of any sort, 
they can't. And I found something interesting uh, last year. We've had some individuals here with Middle Eastern descent. Um, and I did not know that uh, they get permanent tattoos of eyebrows mm. and eyelashes. And that has a metal in it. Mm -hmm. And that's contraindicated. So um, I mean, it's up to the radiologist to know that. But just interesting, if we're dealing with certain families, some of these tests they can't have because of the uh, of the metal that's in the ink. So very interesting. It heats up. It's supposedly yeah. pretty important. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So the prevalence of epilepsy co-occurring in the ID population is about 22%, compared at 1.8% of the general population. So it is obviously much higher in this population than in the general population. Um, I did look at our Region 5 Long Island data um, regarding neurological conditions, and approximately 20% of our cases have neurological conditions, which are mostly seizures. Um, so it is consistent with that data, um, as well as consistent nationally uh, when talking to um, the national team as well. Individuals with intellectual disabilities are also more likely to have status epileptus, which is a medical emergency associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Um, it's defined as a continuous seizure lasting more than 30 minutes or two or more seizures without full recovery of consciousness between them. The ID population are also more likely to have communication deficits, which make treatment more difficult. They also tend to have more behavioral health symptoms, which overlap and cause difficulty in determining the cause. It also can be difficult to engage individuals with ID in the testing that's required for epilepsy. As I just went through all the possible tests that could be used, most of them do not sound comfortable, um, especially EEGs. Um, they can be uncomfortable with the glue if anyone's had one. Um, there's glue attached to their heads. It can cause a lot of issues with sensory um, concerns. There's also might be fearful because they can't understand the processes with something like an MRI. Um, anyone that's had an MRI knows like the banging that occurs <laughs> in the machine. Um, that can be very overwhelming as well as very scary for someone with ID. Um, it's unnerving for most people. So imagine someone with ID. Um, 30 to 40% of the ID population with epilepsy are also treatment resistant to their seizures, um, which we, as Heather talked about, Ben seizures are currently uncontrolled, you know, despite many medication trials. So we are in that process of really trying to find something that might work for him. Um, but right now he has been fairly resistant to treatment. Okay, continuing on. Um, approximately one in four children with epilepsy will have significant behavioral challenges. Another one in four children will have emotional difficulties, which might be less severe, but still concerning. In general, behavioral problems are more troublesome in children whose seizures begin in an early age. This is especially true for boys who are more likely to act out, uh, but girls are also affected. Their emotional problems may be just recognized less often. Behavior difficulties can be caused or worsened by epilepsy. Several aspects of epilepsy can affect the brain and contribute to the behavior problems, such as the underlying brain damage, the seizures themselves, the small electrical discharges between seizures, and the effects of seizure medications. Any of these can impair normal brain functions or may cause chemical imbalances in the brain that lead to psychiatric difficulties. In some cases, small effects accumulate over many years and can cause psychiatric problems to emerge in adulthood as well. You may also see brief periods of abnormal behavior leading up to a seizure, during a seizure, or even up to a few days following a seizure. Um, a few children will swing back and forth between uncontrolled seizures and bad behavior. Even older children who have had seizure surgery may be extra emotional for up to a half a year after the operation. So it's really important to understand that because a lot of times we'll hear, you know, there was no trigger. We don't know what happened. Um, even if it's several days after a seizure, it could still be related to that seizure occurring. Uh, all types of epilepsy can make children prone to behavior problems. Um, so complex partial seizures, especially of early onset, um, and those are focal seizures that turn to general seizures, could cause hyperactivity, problems in paying attention or controlling their temper. Seizures from the left side of the brain can cause anxiety and frustration due to the problems in understanding and expressing ideas. Seizures from the right side of the brain can cause social difficulties and impulsive behavior from problems in recognizing social signals. And seizures from the front of the brain can cause disorganization and acting without regard to consequences. 
So sleep is a really important part of the case that we reviewed earlier um, that Heather went over. Um, ben has significant seizure activity at nighttime. His most recent um, sleep EEG indicated 240 um, instances and activity indicating that he never enters REM sleep. Um, so he's pretty much always tired. <laughs> um, patients with epilepsy are at risk for seizure disorders. One of the main reasons is that seizures or the epileptic state itself may alter sleep organization. Seizures have immediate effects on sleep, resulting in a stage shift to a lighter stage of non-REM sleep or to the awake state. They also have a more delayed effect on the REM sleep and other sleep parameters. Excessive daytime sleepiness is a common complaint amongst epilepsy patients because of this. Certain stages of sleep provide a hyper <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, a hypersynchronous, oh my God, I can't say it, synchronous state, allowing more frequent epileptic form abnormalities along with more frequent seizures. Nocturnal seizures disrupt sleep, increase daytime drowsiness. Dow's drowsiness can increase the risk of daytime seizures for people affected by seizures during sleep. So that continuous cycle will happen for these individuals. Nocturnal seizures are also a risk factor for sudden, un sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, which is obviously a very serious concern. Sleep apnea is also approximately twice as common in people with poorly controlled epilepsy than in the general population. Um, and sleep apnea was something of concern for Ben, um, but he did have uh, the surgery. He removed his tonsils his and tonsils and adenoids, um, and that had improved um, his situation. People with epilepsy and a sleep disorder have a poorer quality of life compared to those with no sleep disorder and treatment of the sleep disorder improves seizure control and the quality of life. Sleep disorders can exacerbate seizures um, and epilepsy can exacerbate the sleep disorder. So again, that cycle um, continues, especially for someone like Ben. Um, it's estimated that 12% of people with epilepsy have nocturnal seizures. So it is a pretty high concern for people with epilepsy. Um, and it does affect and influence the sleep-wake cycle. Um, so like I said before, that changes in states. Every time that seizure activity happens, it knocks it down to um, a, a lower stage of sleep, which is what's happening for Ben. He's never entering those deep sleep moments. He's always in, in the awake or the light sleep, uh, which obviously very much impacts him. Um, it is believed that nocturnal seizures are triggered by changes in the electro electrical activity in the brain. Uh, when moving between those different stages of sleep, um, between the sleep and awakened stages. Um, and it's interestingly enough, if you enter REM sleep, seizures don't seem to happen as often, um, but it may happen in other cycles. Um, so if Ben never enters REM sleep, according to his medical evaluations, he's always at risk to have these nocturnal seizures. Okay, seizures in ADHD. I mentioned previously that seizures can be mistaken for ADHD. Aside from that, people with epilepsy have an increased risk of ADHD in general. Studies show from a 10 to 20% increase in the chance that someone with epilepsy will have ADHD. Now, this is important because clearly the epilepsy has to be treated first, and certain anti-epileptic medications have side effects that can also mimic ADHD. So we have to be aware of that. Um, so what do you do if you have seizures under control, but there's still ADHD symptoms, which is really not uncommon? Well, first of all, you make sure it's not the side effects from the meds. You go over the medications that they're using for the seizures and see, is that doing it? Is it dose dependent? Can we come up with an alternative? Um, obviously, you use behavioral interventions, accommodations in school, coaching of the system in terms of how to better communicate. However, medication is sometimes needed for both, and that's a very touchy area because there's understandable concern that meds for ADHD can lower seizure threshold. It is a possibility, but research shows it's really quite a minimal risk. And if you take anything from this slide, other than I kind of put it together kind of sloppy and it's a little crooked there, I didn't realize it, now I'm seeing it. But anyway, <laughs> stimulants are not, NOT, stimulants are not contraindicated in individuals with well-controlled seizures. Um, I've worked with many neurologists and in conjunction, we've used the combination of the anti-seizure meds and the stimulants. But as Heather said before, in this case, there may not be good communication. This is an example where it's essential so that each side knows what they're doing and you can treat both morbidities 
and not exacerbate either one of them individually. All right, this slide has an 80% chance of putting someone to sleep. So <laughs> I will try to go through this and make it practical. This is all about the different uh, anti-seizure medications. Uh, so I'll figure some brief stuff that I think we run into the most. Barbiturates, like phenobar. That was the mainstay also of anti-anxiety medicines before benzodiazepines were founded. And you still may see some phenobarbital being used for seizures. I don't think you'll see it a lot for psychiatric behavioral health symptoms anymore. But for seizures, it's a very, very effective drug. The main thing you watch out if someone's on phenobarb is for sedation. And it's really unsafe if there's an overdose. It does not take a lot uh, for that to kill somebody. Whereas if somebody took excessive amount of oclonopin or Xanax, yeah, yes, it's still dangerous, but not at the level of a, of a barbiturate. Um, benzodiazepines, very familiar, I'm sure, with Valium, Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax. Some of these are used for anti-seizure purposes, in particular, uh, Clonopin. Valium is a rescue one for sure. And the main worries if you see someone who's on that medication list are sedation, addiction potential, and obviously driving, or as they always look to put on bottle, bottles, operating machine, heavy machinery. Um, so that that's something you have to keep in mind. Dopamine, that's a newer second line medication, very significant risk of aplastic anemia, which is not making your own blood cells, which is clearly not a good thing to have happen. Um, so felbamate is not usually a first choice, but you may run into some uh, individuals on it. Carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. I want to point out the topiramate or topamax because we do see a lot of that. The concern there, side effect wise, is kidney stones, kidney functioning in general. Um, topamax, as the dose goes up, can make you have a decrease in executive functioning. So that's something super, super important to follow. Next on the list, Tegretol and Trileptol. Uh, generics for those are carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine. They're used frequently. You'll see probably lately more of the ox than the, than the regular Tegretol because you don't have to worry about the blood count as much and as much of the blood testing. The main things to look out for in those individuals if you're working with them are tiredness, dizzy, headaches. Um, but that's possible, but they're generally commonly used and well tolerated. Now, valproic acid and Depakote, hugely common. Um, obviously, we use that for bipolar disorder, and you also see it for seizure prevention. What you have to look out for there, uh, anytime someone's on that, I'll, I'll mention in a consult, is blood testing. You want to see liver function tests. Blood clotting, that's one that people often don't know, but it can delay the prothrombin time, and you could have delayed clotting, and that could be significant. And pancreas involvement. Um, and what you do for that is measure something called amylase. So in blood testing, it's fairly simple to, uh, to check that stuff out. It's a good anti-epileptic, and you're definitely going to run across it, uh, but there are things you need to uh, keep an eye on. Next on the list are the GABA meds. Uh, GABA is a, uh, a site that's very associated with anxiety, and a lot of ongoing research uh, in the major drug, com drug companies is looking at interventions there for anxiety medicines per se. And I think over the next couple of years, you're gonna see that. The ones you guys will have probably run into already are Neurontin, which is gabapentin. That, as the dose goes up, can cause tiredness, dizziness, and even ataxia. Lyric is a breakdown of the, of the uh, gabapentin. A uh, little more addicting because it has more anti-anxiety effects. In Europe, it actually does have its approval for generalized anxiety, but it's not in the United States. Um, I don't use it a lot, and that's not because I don't like it. It's because I can't get it covered. Um, I've had a couple people did beautifully on it, but it's just almost impossible to get insurances to cover it. You have to fail a million things before you're able to get to it. Um, where I also find these two very, very helpful is you have an individual with anxiety or depression with physical pain. Um, they are proof for neuropathic pain, such as herpes, diabetes, uh, and also we use them a lot in fibromyalgia and autoimmune disorders to, uh, but what it seems to do is affect the pain threshold. It's not that your body's not reacting the same, it's just not triggering it in your brain so much. So there's a bit of a blockage for that. Lastly, one of my, one of my favorite meds, uh, Lamictal, I use a lot of that because I think the side effect profile is super easy. That is approved for seizures. Uh, in psych, we got it originally approved 
as a depressive component for bipolar, but we're also now using it for depression as an add-on in unipolar depression. Main side effect, it's really rare, but super duper important is a rash. That rash is potentially a deadly rash. Um, so compliance, when we go over have patients compliance on meds, it's no more important on any medicine than it is on Lamictal. Um, if it is not titrated slowly, they used to have the starter packs, which were great. You would just push out the little pill. It would show 25 for two weeks, you know, then, then 50 for two weeks, then 100. Those also I can't get covered. So I have to write the, in a bottle and, and, and explain it to my patient. But where you run into a problem is even if someone takes it perfectly, is compliance. If they stop and they've missed it for four or five days, you got to go back to go. You cannot go back to the dose you were, you were taking. And I try to explain that from day one because some patients are embarrassed. They don't want to say, oh, I left it home. You know, I didn't want it. I restarted it. You cannot do that. You have to, have to go back. They usually say if it's less than four or five days, you're okay. But if it's even close, I just make people go back to the store because it's not worth it. And a Stevens Johnson rash, um, the way to recognize it, it's not only the torso, it goes to the mucosal membrane. So you'll see swelling in the lips, swelling. It could be vaginally, it could be rectally, but it's really a medical emergency and they have to go for supportive care. So as great as Lamictal is, and I have to tell you, I almost never see that side effect. I do stress it when I tell people about it just because it's preventable. Um, so that, that, that's an important one. Great. So in addition to medication, there are some uh, therapies that can be done um, for someone with seizures. So the first one is vagus nerve stimulation. So in this stimulation, doctors will implant a device called a vagus, vagus nerve stimulator underneath the skin of the chest, similar to a heart pacemaker. The wires from the stimulator are connected to the vagus nerve in your neck, and the battery powdered device sends bursts of electrical energy through the vagus nerve to your brain. It's not clear how this inhibits seizures, to be honest, the research wasn't clear, but the de device can usually reduce seizures by 20 to 40%, so it is fairly successful. Um, most people will still need to take an anti-epileptic medication, although some people may be able to lower their medication doses, which given what Andy just talked about could potentially impact um, side effects is very helpful. Um, there are side effects of the vagus nerve stimulation that could occur, such as throat pain, hoarse voice, or shortness of breath, um, or coughing. So those are things that you would want to look out for. Um, another uh, potential is the ketogenic diet. So the keto diet, as people mostly uh, hear of it. Some children with epilepsy have been able to reduce their seizures by following a strict diet that's high in fats and low in carbs. In this diet, the body breaks down fats instead of the carbohydrates for energy. After a few years, some children may be able to stop the ketogenic diet under close supervision of their doctors and remain seizure-free. Side effects of the ketogenic diet may include dehydration, constipation, slow growth because of the nutritional deficiencies, and a buildup of the uric acid in the blood, which could cause kidney stones. Side effects are uncommon um, if the diet is properly managed and medically supervised. Following a ketogenic diet can be challenging, especially for children. Um, so low glycemic index and modified Atkins diets offer less restrictive alternatives, but may still provide some benefit for seizure control. Um, and another is the deep brain stimulation. So in this stimulation, surgeons implant electrodes into a specific part of the brain, specifically the thalamus. The electrodes are connected to a generator implanted in your chest in the, or in your skull that sends electrical pulses to the brain and may reduce your seizures. Um, so those are some other areas that can always be looked into if medications are not successful or in addition to medications. Um, it's also important to talk quickly through some support for the system because as we discussed, it's not only the individual, especially an individual with ID that has epilepsy, um, oftentimes it causes burnout and concern in a system. Um, so you always want to help the system stick to a routine as much as possible. Um, make sure that they're using positive attitudes related to epilepsy. You know, the last thing you want is anxiety because somebody has epilepsy. Um, and we see that quite a bit, that they're nervous about having a seizure. So they're further uh, avoiding activities or further um, avoiding different areas. Um, developing a varied support network. So having some a child with ID, um, can be isolating in of itself. And then you add epilepsy, um, it can also be extremely um, isolating. 
especially given what we talked about earlier with the rescue medications can only be given by trained people. Um, so it limits people that can interact with the individual. Um, it ensures that those few people that can provide that rescue medication are always around that person, giving them limited outside time and supports um, causing burnout, which Heather did talk about in this case as well. Um, also, supporting the individual having choice and independence when safe. So this is something that is really important, not only just with this case, but just in general. Oftentimes, individuals with ID and individuals with ID and epilepsy don't have much choice in their life. They are not able to choose the activities they might want to do or the people they might want to be around. Um, and their independence is definitely impacted. Um, imagine not being able to go somewhere where you are never alone because someone always has to be able to give your rescue medication and monitor your seizures. Um, so whenever it's possible, try to support the system in giving those choices, providing that independence. Um, for Ben, it was a really big moment when we were able to get the um, embrace uh, seizure watch because it does provide some independence. If the parents are notified via the watch, they don't maybe don't have to stand over him at all times. He can have some moments alone. Um, I know he even had a little bit of anxiety when he was away from his phone at certain points, um, but his family reminded him like, we're here, we're still gonna see it even if the watch doesn't tell us. Um, but he he's very much come accustomed to it. And it's been, I think, able to give him a little bit more sense of independence. Um, changing the rescue med also will be helpful for him as well as we talked about before. And the last area that's really important is gaining support for the caregivers. So whether it be support groups, their own therapy, opportunities to kind of share their experiences and build their own, um, their own support groups is really important. Having, like I said, this is a very isolating condition, not just for the individual, but also for their families. Oftentimes it affects um, outings, it affects family events as it did with Ben. Um, recently, a few months ago, they had to leave a family party. Um, so making sure that the caregivers have that support is really important. All right, so th this slide is sort of the a summarizing slide, uh, so a little bit repetitive, but some things I think are important to take away. Um, starting with it's fairly obvious to us that medications in neurology are used in psychiatry and vice versa, there's clear overlap. So what becomes important to us in working with these individuals with ASD and IDD is to know why they're on the medication, who's writing them, and do they still need them? I, I kind of think going into a case, that's a, a sort of an important way to, to look at it. And when you look at the list, Depakote used commonly in bipolar with or without seizure history. Lamictal used for depressive symptoms, as I mentioned before. Topamax, I want to go back to a little bit because you're going to see it uh, in, a, in a different fashion. Um, it causes some weight loss. So it's not FDA approved for that, but as psychiatrists, we're all excited that we could actually give somebody something that causes weight loss because we're always accused of fattening everybody up and try not to. Now, the deal with this is it's not FDA approved for that. Um, and as you, you're seeing in the news lately, we sometimes have to use meds like the uh, malaria drug that they're going to be now testing and maybe using for coronavirus. Sometimes it, it's okay. So I've sometimes been reported cases and say, well, that's not FDA approved, so it's wrong. No, not necessarily. It just has to be understood why they're using it, explained to the family, you know, to the system, consent received. And Topamax is a, a perfect, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess a less deadly example um, that you want to try to uh, counteract some of the side effects and that will cause uh, some weight reduction. Trileptal Integritol, as I mentioned before, um, the trileptal or the oxycarbamazepine, as it's called, is easy to use since there's no monitoring of the blood count. Also, my opinion seems to be a little more calming. Uh, the gabapentin or neurontin, as I noted above, uh, great when someone has physical pain. Um, so lastly, in this talk, I thought, because I get asked a lot, what's the general opinion on whether psych meds lower seizure threshold? And most actually have a minimal impact. That doesn't mean it's clear sailing. You go case by case. The one most notable exception is clozapine. Um, and I think it's important to note that it's dose dependent. If somebody is on a lower dose, it may not have an impact, as much of an impact as the higher dose. Best case of that ever is Welbutrin. Welbutrin, when it first came out, was taken off the market because people were having seizures. But when it was first marketed, it was marketed at a dose of 600 milligrams. They went and restudied it, and at 150 and 300, 
its impact is no different than the SSRI, so it's very easy to use. It is approved up to 450. I have people on 450. I will not use 450 if there's a seizure history because common sense tells me I'm starting to get a little closer to that range. But I guess the most important point here is that you have to check each medicine out, um, but there's not a general rule of thumb that you know medications, um, antidepressants, antipsychotics are gonna cause seizures. A little bit of anecdotal stuff on olanzapine not being the top choice, uh, so it's worth looking at the list and going over, um, but absolutely at times, and as Elise mentioned, the comorbidity is so large where we have to treat the psychiatric disorders, even though the person has epilepsy. Absolutely. One thing I just want to add to regarding whether um, the medication is being used for neurological or psychiatric or potentially both, it's important to know what the purpose it's being prescribed for. Um, so sometimes we do have, especially our younger clients, their meds are being prescribed both psychiatric and neurologically by a neurologist only. The system hasn't gone to a psychiatrist yet. You know, they're, you know, they might be fairly young. Um, but like Andy said, a lot of these medications do have an overlap. You know, Topamax can also be prescribed for migraines and for headaches. So there's a lot of different use for some of these medications. Um, as we know, a lot of the anticonvulsants like Depakote could also be used for mood stabilization. Um, so sometimes Depakote might be used for mood stabilization even though they have seizures and they're addressing seizures with other medications. When maybe we don't need all of these medications to address these separate issues and maybe we can have that overlap benefit them by not taking so many meds. So those are things to really just keep in mind when you're evaluating a client's um, medication list is why they're on the med, what those overlaps are, um, and how it might be impacting them. And that is our presentation today. Without having you guys in person, there weren't a lot of, we usually we get stopped quite a bit for questions. So does anyone have any questions, any thoughts? Well, either we did a great job or everybody got disconnected and went on Zoom. I can't figure or it out. Or went to sleep. <laughs> no, actually this was, really, really interesting information. And my head was just spinning because I was thinking about one person and then the other person. Um, so I was bouncing around um, things that I've noticed in people. Uh, so it was so interesting because it made so much sense. Now, Dr. Kent, um, would you be able to explain a little further um, regarding cholesterol levels and women who are pregnant, because I know that you mentioned something about that, which I find is very interesting to know, especially being a woman, not that, you know, I'm planning to have any children soon, but I do know <laughs> clients that would be, <laughs> no laughing, uh, um, that that information is, is, is fascinating. It's really interesting to know. Yeah, I guess it, it, it came up in talking about stroke and just that if the cholesterol level, uh, you know, that needs to be monitored, uh, the, if it's high, the carotid artery needs to be monitored with a, a sonogram with a Doppler, um, because that would place the person at higher risk of, uh, you know, of having a stroke and, and, and causing, you know, all kinds of difficulties, you know, whether it's paralysis, uh, epilepsy, things of that sort. So, yeah, in, in pregnancy, it is a bit of an increased risk. That's true. Although we were sort of talking about the, the fetal involvement, but the mom also has to be watched for that in addition. Would that, if the mother has that would, and she is pregnant, could it impact the fetus? I don't think there's any data to show that the, the fetus would have a higher problem with, uh, you know, a higher risk for stroke or anything of that sort. But clearly if the mother is having that yes. then there's just a general problem for the for the fetal development but i don't i don't know that there's a correlation between heart cholesterol and and, and the fetal at that point okay. yeah. it's a good thing to look up uh, i will i will get back to people <laughs> thank great. you thanks sure. Edith. great question anyone else have any thoughts or questions or recommendations for ben's system i do have one question just to kind oh, cool. of just to kind of gain further knowledge um you know, I, I was not very familiar with epilepsy and ID. Um, it, I was not really even that familiar with um, too much regarding epilepsy on its own. So I'm just learning a lot right now that I'm hoping that I'll be able to utilize throughout my future uh, work with START and my systems. Um, I, I know this is kind of a, a small point, but I'm wondering, 
you know, you were stating that in this case specifically, um, Ben is experiencing multiple, like hundreds of um, kind of episodes like throughout the night. Mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Kent was stating that some of them can be like as short as a second. Mm -hmm. um, do they create pain? Do they create pain? Not necessarily. Um, some can reach the threshold that would wake somebody up. Some it may just be like a quick mild zap. It I mean, really the whole the whole spectrum is is fair game. Uh, from not even knowing you're having it to to severe pain from the um, you know from the spasming of the muscles. So a, a, anything goes with that kind of a question. Mm -hmm. So if if someone is not aware that they're experiencing these th things throughout the night. Um, but they are waking, maybe very tired, or it might just be something that a, a doctor would find kind of upon examination if they were doing a sleep study or something like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And one thing we also, I don't think we pointed out with the sleep section is if it's preventing them from getting into REM, that next day, not only they are tired, but they may be prone to REM rebound. Mm -hmm. And REM rebound is when your brain tries to dream during the day. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody has a, a disorder of social communication, they may actually look psychotic mm -hmm. because they may be going through their dream and you think they're hearing things, seeing things, and it's just their brain doing what we're all doing at night. I'm sure some of our dreams are pretty darn psychotic. Uh, you know, <laughs> and this person's now just doing it during the day. So yeah. if they're getting uh, REM suppressed, that's a super important thing to know. Absolutely. Thank you for that information. Um, it's very, very helpful. That sounds completely overwhelming for an individual to experience. Um, but, but thank you. I'm glad to be able to learn more about this today. Sure. Yeah, and it's interesting with this case because um, like you said, people might not realize that they're even having seizure, nocturnal seizures because maybe they're not having anything during the day, but they're tired. They may be diagnosed with insomnia and just assumed that you know they just have insomnia. Um, so it is important, especially in our cases um, that, you know, working with that have the comorbid IDD that we are really analyzing and thinking that through. Have they had a neurological consult? Let's maybe bring them in for one just to make sure that there's nothing else going on. Um, obviously, things like sleep apnea could be addressed as well. Um, and all of those things could really be looked at by doing a overnight EEG and just making sure that everything is, is firing correctly. Um, and this case too, you know, he'll, they will complain or he will complain that he's tired during the day. Um, and I feel like at some times it's not necessarily, you know, thought about, right, Heather, of like, well, he's never getting a decent night's sleep. We all would be irritable and tired throughout the day as well. Um, so I think even just helping to support the family and the system in Maybe like when he gets home from school, you know, you can't have nap time in the middle of, of middle school, but maybe, you know, when he gets home from school, he has 30 minutes or an hour to lay down before they start asking him to do other things. You know, maybe that's something that we can kind of institute with the system. Um, but I think sometimes there's there's frustration um, and they kind of forget that he's never entering that, that sleep and potentially some of his other symptoms are related to that REM uh, rebound that, that Andy was just talking about. Absolutely, um, you know, Sure, a nap could be something that could help, I suppose. I My question is, if he's never entering REM sleep, is the nap even going to really be effective? Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, he might not enter REM sleep during that period of time either, but even just relaxing his body, laying in bed, being calm. Um, ben is pretty much always active. He has a lot of activities, as Heather went through, between you know his yeah. horseback riding and his um, game development program, um, as well as obviously school. Um, and when he's home, he's doing coaching, you know, one night, one day a week, and he's doing, he has other, um, you know, other activities with the family. Um, and I believe the family has sports involvements and things like that, hockey, right, the brother. Um, so there's a lot going on in the family, as well as then asking him to do homework. Um, and from what mm -hmm. we've seen is, I think it's kind of just go, go, go. So even just giving him that time to just decompress for a little while, even if he doesn't have a deep sleep during that period of time, could potentially just be helpful just to rest his brain a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, anybody would be tired doing as much as they're doing. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, and just that I've gotten a bunch of people through the years off of stimulants once their sleep problem was approved, improved. Uh, it turned out their sluggishness, their their ADD, the lack of productivity was re really sleep deprivation. So that's always kind of a nice rewarding thing to do when I can have somebody uh, wean off that and, and not need it. Yep.
Does anyone else have any questions or thoughts? No? Heather, do you have, I know obviously um, we didn't get a ton of recommendations from people, but <laughs> did you have anything that you thought about while you were kind of listening that you could maybe apply to the case or talk to the system about? Um, well, everything we went over with, I think super useful, especially in, um, you know, enhancing collaboration with the neurologists mm -hmm. and psychiatrists, noting that um, how all the different psych and neuro meds might interact mm -hmm. um, and exploring the different medication side effects that he gets from the psychiatrist and he gets from the neurologist and how they mm -hmm. might be affecting him in different ways. Yeah. Um, and the opportunities for relaxation might be a super important thing to add into his daily schedule. Um, because his, his week does get chaotic mm -hmm. and um, the parents are busy with their jobs as well. So even if just everybody takes a half hour of, yeah. of break within the home, mm -hmm. it might help the whole family. Absolutely. You know? um, and now the, di the diet I thought was super interesting, mm -hmm. um, getting supports for the family because you can see their burnout um, and then having him gain independence a little bit because yeah. he, is, he is getting older. So the older he gets, he probably wants more and more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. All right. Well, if there's no other questions or comments, this will conclude our uh, March CET on epilepsy. Um, thank you guys for joining us, especially given everything that's been going on. I know everyone is very busy. Um, so I'm glad that you guys were able to join us via Zoom today.